Hello, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Bennett, the Research Manager at the Royal Armouries and welcome to the seventh talk in our Winter Lecture Series. The Royal Armouries, for those who don't know us already, is the UK's national collection of arms and armour. If you don't know us for our collection of modern military firearms, you may well know us for our European armours, such as those belonging to Henry VIII or the collection of English Civil War armour from Littlecote House. However, the museum has always had an international focus and as early as 1662, visitors to the collection at the Tower of London could see a Japanese armour presented to King James I, albeit misidentified as having been presented by the Great Mogul. All of our three sites are now open, although pre-booking is strongly advised, and at all three you'll see objects from around the world, now properly identified at least to the best of our abilities. Uh, however, we also have an extensive programme of online content, including blogs, talks, features, and our online catalogue, as well as other online events. Whatever you're interested in, you'll find more details at our website, which is royalarmories.org. Now, this winter lecture series will run until March 2022, and will cover an eclectic mix of topics relating to arms and armour over the centuries. So far, we've seen talks on everything from Second World War infantry anti-tank projectors and the armed radicalism of 1960s America, to lost Dark Age battles and forgotten English armour styles of the late Middle Ages. So as usual, uh, all the talks will be broadcast on li uh, live on both Zoom and YouTube and will stay available to watch on demand on YouTube. Uh, if you're interested in what we've done already, please feel free to check out our YouTube channel and see what's there. If you'd like to see what's on in future, keep an eye on our website or follow us on, on Eventbrite to stay up to date with those events. For now, you'll have opportunities to ask questions to the speaker after the talk. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please type your question in the uh, chat box on the right-hand side of the page. If you're watching via Zoom, you'll find the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen where you can type questions. Uh, we may not be able to get through everything that everyone asks, but we will do our best to cover as much as possible. So with the necessary preparation out of the way, uh, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Anna Gubinskaya. Uh, we're particularly grateful to Anna for joining us because she's doing so from Wellington in New Zealand, contending with a 13-hour time difference, which I think is as bad as it physically gets. Uh, her, her research interests lie in images of weapons in medieval literature, and particularly in cross-cultural communication, uh, especially between uh, Europe and Japan. So without any further ado then, our speaker today, Anna Gubinskaya. I will now share my screen. In this lecture, I will briefly outline the history and the significance of the image of the armored knight in late Victorian art and how this image got disseminated worldwide with Meiji Japan as one of the examples. There will be three parts of my lecture. I will firstly outline the idea of the Middle Ages in Victorian society, then how these ideas translated into the image of the armored knight in art, and lastly, how Japanese writer Natsume Soseki incorporated this imagery in his literary works. So what kind of ideas about Middle Ages did the Victorians cultivate? Victorian medievalism or as it was known in contemporary literature, Gothic revival is a topic of acute scholarly interest. The term medieval itself is relatively young. It was not used in medieval times and makes its first appearance in print in 1570. At that time, the word medieval was used not in modern meaning indicating a certain historical period, but to refer to the past year, past age of superstitions. In the Age of Enlightenment, it was used to indicate the dark ages between classical antiquity and the Renaissance. It was first recorded in print in the modern meaning only in 1827. However, it has not become a part of the household vocabulary until the 1830s. At around the same time, the word medievalism would be occasionally used to point towards the idyllic past colored by the hue of nostalgia. In the essay, The Return to the Middle Ages, a semiotician Umberto Eco states that even though a certain degree of interest in the past existed at probably all times, Victorians were the first to attempt reviving the Middle Ages and inhabiting this newly constructed medieval space. 
In the years preceding the coronation of Queen Victoria and during the early years of her reign, a number of events would be symptoms, but they also catalyzed the chivalric revival that was to culminate in its influence during the later years of her reign. To name just a few, these are uh, the publication of Walter Scott's Ivanhoe, uh, Ken Elm Dugby's The Broad Stone of Honor, The Burning of the Palace of Westminster in 1837, and the competition for its replacement. The publication, the publication of Augustus Pugin's Contrasts in 1836 and the Eglinton Tournament. Interestingly, Dugby used the word a knight and uh, the word a gentleman interchangeably, creating this kind of constructed class of new knighthood defined by the idea of abiding by a chivalric code of conduct. The scholars have no single opinion on the reasons for this Gothic revival. As it is the most apparent in print and coincided with many major publications on medieval history and literature, reprints of Chaucer and Mallory have been published and collections of medieval po poetry have been put together for the first time, many contemporary thinkers uh, would connect the two and they would, saw, uh, they would see the root of this Gothic revival in literature. On the other hand, the 19th century was largely influenced by the political and economic events. The French Revolution was seen as a disaster and a downfall of all the ideas of enlightenment. And the following Napoleonic Wars prompted the rise of national thought in the European countries and forced them to turn to Middle Ages in the search of their national roots and identity. Furthermore, the Industrial Revolution resulted in a spiking growth of urban population and a massive, at places catastrophic, withdrawal of labor force from the countryside. As the lands became abandoned and the gentry of the countryside lost their wealth, they saw industrialization as a form of social corruption, while the Middle Ages were imagined as a time of peaceful and harmonious coexistence of the landlords and the farmers. In the work, A Dream of Order, Alice Chandler points out that even the significant increase in knowledge about the historical past, um, the reference to Middle Ages was exploited as a political device, especially in the debates between Whigs and Tory in English parliament. And uh, this exploitation started around the first quarter of the 19th century. Tories' majority were descendants from the country, and most of them would see their privileges and wealth rooted in medieval past, quote unquote. The imaginary past was a legendary time of stability, harmony, free of exploitation, and intensive labor patterns of the industrial age. Christian revivalism pressed for the ideas of morality in the Middle Ages. And the royal court would seek the justification and legitimization of their rule in the medieval past. Augustus Pugin's book Contrasts uh, that was published in 1836 serves as evidence of how this idealized view of the Middle Ages seeped into reception of art and architecture of 14th, 15th century England. There is a not so subtle social criticism ingrained in his writing. As Pugin depicts the Gothic architecture to be more harmonious and even moral, he uh, subtly calls for Catholic revival. If we pay attention to the introduction of his book, we read, I have placed the architectural productions of the 19th century in fair contrast with those of the 14th and 15th. That the former edifices appear to great disadvantage when thus tried by the scale of real excellence will be readily admitted by all who are competent to think on the subject. And if we browse through the uh, publication itself, we will see uh, that the contrast is pretty striking and uh, on one of the last prints, uh, we can see this comparison of the 14th century London and the same place in modern 19th century. 
and uh, uh, the captions uh, point out that every landmark of the 1400s is a church, while if we pay attention to the uh, picture on the top, uh, there are such uh, landmarks as a playhouse, a lunatic asylum, and other horrible places uh, of corruption. A more immersive mode of the existence of the Middle Ages was represented by events held in medieval style. An iconic example is Eglinton tournament. In 1839, Lord Eglinton hosted a medieval joust. The layout and the rules of the tournament were inspired by the Book of Tournaments of King René, dating back to 1400s, and a depiction of the tournament in the book Ivanhoe. The participants were unprepared for medieval style of tilt, so they spent months and months uh, to become the best possible embodiment of a medieval warrior. Many suits of armor worn by the participants were antique from their personal collections, and many were acquired from the dealers uh, starting this kind of um, armor dealership as a profitable business. The tournament turned out to be a disaster and was torn apart uh, by modern, uh, by contemporary press. And Eglinton being in Scotland added a layer of political controversy as the Scottish nobility was the most reactionary in terms of their political message and the industrialization affected Scottish countryside probably the most. In 1842, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert hosted a medieval costumed ball in Buckingham Palace. On a canvas commemorating the event that you can see on the left, Queen is depicted as Queen Philippa and Prince Albert as Edward III. The costumes were painstakingly copied from the effigies. However, it is quite obvious uh, that the silhouette of the Queen's dress repeats the fashionable silhouette of the 1840s. Following this occasion, uh, in 1844, on Queen Victoria's birthday, Prince Albert presented her with, with a portrait, which you can see on the right, Apologies. Uh, where he is depicted wearing a suit of armor. Uh, Queen Victoria writes in her diary, my beloved Albert is painted in, al in armor, which I so much wished. I cannot say how beautiful it is, nor how it exactly portrays the original. Uh, scholars mentioned that this portrait was quite a breakthrough for Victorian art because Prince Albert has taken part in no specific event. He was not posing as a historical character and he had never been near a battlefield. His armor symbolizes his royal uh, chivalric qualities in everyday life, which haven't been seen before in such portraits. Furthermore, in 1851, the Great Exhibition took place at the Crystal Palace in Hyde Park and featured a medieval court. An article in the exhibition guidebook demonstrates how Middle Ages were presented uh, to commoners, to common people uh, by the mid-century. So we read, the medieval court in the strikingly harmonious combination of its stained glass hardware, wood carving, hangings, eucastic tiles, all successful repetitions of Gothic models will at least have the merit of suggesting to many who would not otherwise have heard of such facts, the fullness of beauty and character and the homogeneousness of medieval design applied to domestic uh, as to ecclesiastic purposes. That's a quite interesting observation because I'm definitely one of those people uh, who didn't have uh, any impression of Middle Ages as homogenous uh, era, especially when it comes to design. Uh, the same article uh, later uh, mentions that ancient art in pagan times was honest and truthful and despised shams, just as uncivilized art still does in New Zealand. And so was early Christian art. And in its turn, what our French neighbors call the art of the Moyen Age, Middle Ages. 
it was left for the last two centuries to witness the visible decadence of all principles of artistic truth and reality. The growth of shams, the corruption of typal ideas of form and ornament. With this kind of sentiment, it is not surprising that many public buildings were erected in the fashionable neo-Gothic pointy style. Probably the most well-known example will be Strawberry Hill House, built in the mid 1700s for Horace Walpole. It precedes the era of the Gothic revival, but harkens back to the same ideas. And Horace Walpole is a well-known time traveler um, uh, who was lost in Middle Ages. His estate was not only resembling a Gothic castle from the facade, but also uh, Walpole was one of the first collectors of medieval armor. And he had a medieval uh, suit of armor on display. When it comes to public spaces, the constellation of famous architects such as James Wyatt, uh, the architect of Font Hill Abbey, his disciple William Pordern, uh, who designed Eaton Hall, Augustus Pugin, the House of Lords in the Palace of Westminster, and Alfred Waterhouse, uh, who uh, designed Manchester Town Hall and Natural History Museum in South Kensington, contributed to the construction of the New Middle Ages. Their adaptation and stylization defined the look of the major British cities and formed the public taste for all things Gothic. This fashion influenced private houses as well, and mansions would copy fashionable trends, and that will result in many castles around England in modern, in, in famous um, neo-Gothic style. Uh, to name a few benchmark publications, reviving the interest of the readership uh, to Middle Ages, we can uh, mention a reprint of uh, Mallory's Morte d'Arthur in 18, 16, Walter Scott's Ivanhoe, 1819, Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, 1829, and Victor Hugo's Notre Dame de Paris, 1831, followed by the poetic reworks of Morte d'Arthur by uh, Alfred Tennyson. Medievalism in fine arts is generally attributed to pre raphaelite Brotherhood in Britain. And the core of the group was formed by such artists as Millet, Hunt, Wulner, and uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Even though they never promoted social medievalism as an idea, their aesthetic canon was resting upon the tropes of the fair lady and the noble knight, and featured romantic ideas of the harmony between the human soul and nature. It is hardly a coincidence that the same artists whose paintings featured ladies and knights and conquerors, defenders of the Christendom, occupied the Olympus of the British Artistic Society. Artists Frederick Clayton, John Everett Millet, Frank Dixie, these names are not only synonymous with the visual dimension of Victorian medievalism, but those people also shared uh, at the Academy of Arts. Uh, to summarize this section, an imagery of Middle Ages portrayed this kind of unified and monolithic aesthetic canon, taking uh, these ideas of uh, ideal medieval world, they rarely focused on a specific decade. And with better understanding of what kind of message was embedded in the image of medieval past uh, in Victorian discourse, we can move on to a depiction of a night in Victorian art. An image of the night uh, existed in ecclesiastical depictions of the saint warriors long before Victorian era. The three most popular Saint Loricati, uh, Saint Petron of Britain, Saint George, uh, Saint Martin of Tours, and uh, Saint Michael. In ecclesiastic tradition, the depiction of armor has deep symbolism, and its roots can be traced back to the text of the scripture. Catherine Smith, uh, in her article Saints in Shining Armor, emphasizes that St. Lori Cate are depicted in medieval sources as people who embody the principles of more martial austerity. In Middle Ages, with the ascent of the class of professional military men, armor is no longer seen as a mere attribute, 
but it forms a part of identity uh, of the medieval warrior. During the early Middle Ages, this physical object sometimes was used uh, to criticize brutality of the knighthood. Uh, but this symbolism gained no prominence in later Middle Ages. And when we are talking about uh, the times beyond Middle Ages themselves, so uh, after 1400s, the symbolism of the armor is quite different. Metaphors of, ar met metaphors of armor harken back to the text of the Bible. For example, in Isaiah 59, 17, he put on justice as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and was clad with zeal as with a cloak. In Paul in Ephesians 6.13, the believers are encouraged to protect themselves with the armor of God in anticipation of the justice. In Thessalonians 5.8, the virtuous Christian is depicted as bearing the breastplate of faith and charity. And for a helmet, he wears a hope of salvation. So armor has become a common metaphor for Christian virtues. It is quite interesting how over time the language evolved uh, to match uh, the technological advancements of the era. For example, uh, lorica, uh, breastplate of the biblical examples, was replaced by spiritual hauberk in 1100s which was complemented by a bridle of chastity and a sword of patience. Uh, I have selected those specific images to demonstrate this kind of uh, visual evolution of the armor and how an artist would depict contemporary armor um, on these um, uh, depictions of the saints. It was definitely not the case for Victorian art uh, because Victorian artists would choose and pick armor of different decades uh, to promote more or less the same idea and to deliver the same message. The images of the believer as one clad in armor or the saint warrior defending Christendom remained quite prominent in Victorian art. On the slide, there are several paintings and many of them are by the same artist. Um, it has to do with his kind of specialty and also with the popularity of this kind of images because uh, he was uh, commissioned to uh, paint the same work over and over again. In this genre of paintings, a knight is accompanied by a feminine looking angel figure or angel figures would assist a Christian to put on uh, their armor. And, uh, in the bottom row, a uh, second to right image depicts this kind of scene with angels putting on a suit of armor. And it is quite interesting uh, to see all those little bits and pieces scattered around the floor. And that makes you wonder, uh, was it a kind of a uh, production line with uh, many Christians being dressed in the same room or uh, what's the process uh, behind those uh, objects on the floor. The idea of the saint warrior closely links with the idea of the knighthood and of ritual, especially the vigil would tie together the secularized function of the knighthood institution and its militarism with spirituality. However, the artworks featuring the armored knight were not limited to this kind of ecclesiastic use. Another important function of the armored body in art is a construction of masculinity, as articulated in an article by Joseph Gessner. Uh, in 20th century men's studies, the chivalric male has become recognized as one of the most important constructions of maleness in culture. The uh, iconography of chivalry in the 19th century, an inscription of maleness and dominance is marked by armor, which transforms the male body into supreme signifier of masculinity. And this is a direct quote from the article from page three. It poses a stark contrast with Greek art, where the nudity would construct masculinity and not the body fully covered by metal plates. 
And on this slide on the right, you can see a canvas painted by Frederick Clayton, who was then the president of the Royal Academy of Arts. And the magazine of art mentions that Birmingham is fortunate to possess so fine, so fine and masculine a piece of work. Um, so Victorians were uh, very well aware of the message uh, that is being uh, promoted by this kind of uh, images. And having an inherent link to the war, uh, armor was not just masculine, it was uh, hyper-masculine. It, uh, it should be remembered that the 19th century was not a peaceful century. It started and ended with uh, major uh, military campaigns in Europe. As uh, articulated in publication Male Fantasies, armor would be used to separate the man from the outer world and create an illusion of invincibility and would be treated uh, not as a mere object, but as an extension of the wearer's body. This image of the knight is not only constructing masculinity, it is used to cultivate gender roles in Victorian society. So by the contrast, uh, it has an effect on the image uh, around feminine body. Uh, in Victorian England, a woman would always be seen either as um, an angel of the household, a kind of a damsel in distress, or as a seductress and temptress and uh, a diabolical woman. Uh, on the canvases, the male body fully covered by plates of armor would often be contrasted with a naked female body or female clothes uh, consisting of floating silks. The male figure is uh, covered with a full plate suit of armor, even in the scenes uh, where uh, the character should be wearing normal clothes or be even naked. So there is no truthfulness to the original in this sense. Uh, moreover, the central figure of the knight on these depictions would often serve as an object of acute interest of uh, female figures. And this interest is mostly unreciprocated. And my favorite example of this is the painting on the left, which is called the Two Crowns, with many ladies uh, throwing flowers under uh, the hooves of the royal stallion but the king remains absolutely indifferent and his uh, eyes are directed towards the crucifixion. So he kind of radiates this idea of chastity and of virtue while all those ladies are very much interested in his manly figure. It is quite interesting how imbalanced are the relationships between the armored knight and the lady. Um, on the contrary, on the pictures of the couples, male and female partners would usually have more or less similar dress. And as you can see on the central picture, the subject of this painting is the wedding. However, the center of attention of every character on the picture is not the couple. It is a man wearing a suit of armor, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, it's a slight digression because there is no image of the knight, uh, but armor will be depicted in Victorian art also as, uh, um, as a symbol of memory and symbol of legacy. And often it will be um, legacy that have been abandoned or forsaken. For example, on the right, you will see uh, the picture by Robert Martineau, the last day of in the old home. And this painting uh, belongs to a genre of moral Victorian painting. It depicts the downfall of the house and uh, the man of the house lost his estate uh, in the doorway in the far left of the picture. You will see uh, a person taking armor uh, to be sold 
at the auction. And on the left, uh, the picture, I wonder who lived in there, uh, it depicts a fact of uh, the artist's life. This scene is in the artist's studio in which on entering one day, he saw his young son, uh, chin on hand, uh, looking on the suit of armor with head full of stories of chivalry. And he said to his father, I wonder who lived in there. Kestner mentions that artists would always be collectors of armor. And he argues it was uh, a way to compensate uh, for the occupation that lacked manliness. And uh, this theory is open uh, to further discussions. To sum up, the Victorian depiction of armor relied mostly on the idea of a body covered by metal, be it plates, scales, chainmail, Gothic or Milanese or Maximilian style would be indifferent for them. Accuracy of the depiction of the armor also seems to play no part. I have selected images that are very good in this regard. Uh, there are images that uh, are not as truthful and probably the artist might not have uh, an object to work from. Uh, what is important is the depiction of this rigid shell covering a human body and radiating ideas of dominance and manliness and um, virtues. Victorian representation of armored body was by no mean uh, lacking a self-reflective component. Victorians were very much aware of the message contained in those paintings. Uh, for example, a painter, uh, a creator of Sir Galahad, Watts wrote, I recognize that from several points of view, art would be a most valuable auxiliary in teaching and nowhere can lessons that may help form the characters of youth of England be more important than in great schools where statements uh, and soldiers and leaders of thought receive their first impressions. Victorians were quite careful in the dissemination of those images. They would print them in uh, catalogs and make copies. There will be exhibitions, especially those exhibitions will be touring around colonies. And uh, there is one curious case study that demonstrates how pervasive is the image of the night in late Victorian period. A person who is dubbed to be the greatest Japanese writer, Natsume Soseki, traveled to England in 1900, and he stayed there for two full years. He left in December 1902. He was the first receiver of uh, the state scholarship, and he chosen to go to London to study uh, English literature. Upon his return to Japan, uh, he picks on writing fiction. In 1905, he's 37. He's a professor of English literature. He has never written a piece of, uh, of fiction. Uh, but in 1905, he publishes several major works. First of them is I Am a Cat, one of his uh, very famous novels. And also, he writes three short novels that are inspired by his experience in London. Uh, one of them is The Tower of London, which is a selection, a collection of essays. It was translated in uh, 2004 into English. It is relatively well known. The other one is called Cairo Ko. The title uh, usually translates as The Shallot Dew. It was translated in, 18, in 1982 for the scholarly publication and have never been reprinted since. And the Phantom Shield have never been translated into English at all. Uh, when we pay closer attention to the text of the Tower of London, and this is my privilege to read this lecture for the Royal Armories, uh, uh, Soseki writes, it is extremely gratifying 
to be able to see one after another things that when I was in Japan, I came across only in history books and novels and which had made not the slightest sense. However, my gratification was short-lived for now it is just as if I have forgotten them all. And so I am back to square one. Yet things which even now remain in my memory are the suits of armor. Amongst them, the one I definitely remember thinking really wonderful was that worn by Henry VI. The whole thing is made of steel and damascened in places. And the most surprising thing is how enormous it is. The man who put on this suit of armor would have to be a giant, at least seven feet tall. It is quite interesting uh, because to begin with, uh, Soseki indicates that he had no prior experience with suits of armor, and this kind of imagery made no sense to him. So in Japan, he was not exposed to this kind of culture. Uh, however, upon uh, uh, returning, he writes two novels that are set in 1400s Britain. Uh, the focal figure, the protagonist of the novel Kairoko, is a knight, and he's a Lancelot, uh, who is depicted wearing suit of armor uh, in the following passage. If you look closer to what looked as if a gust of wind rustled across the crowns of the cluster of willows ten tall long, you will see the sun bathing a full suit of tempered steel iron armor and a white horsehair panache over a foot long fluttering over the matching helmet. I find it interesting because I was trying uh, to do my research and to find what kind of suit of armor uh, Soseki is talking about because uh, a white horsehair panache is not something that I have seen a lot in armor that have been exhibited around the early 1900s in London. It uh, might have been his kind of fantasy because he is writing that he has gotten most of his experience in London. He has been to uh, the uh, Tower of London only once. He has been to many exhibitions of uh, pre raphaelite art, though. So there is this kind of fantasy. And I take it as evidence that Victorian depiction of art would lend itself to this kind of uh, imagination and revisitation. And uh, the novel, The Phantom Shield, is centered around this object, the Phantom Shield, which is introduced in the following words. No one knows uh, from what time this shield originated. It is different from so-called pavis, which is a triangular shield crafted in large size covering the entire body. Neither it is a so-called Gizi shield, that is suspended from a shoulder on a leather strap. And it comes without saying that it is not a type of the shield with a uh, barred opening at the top with a gun barrel coming out of the center, which is an interesting selection of contrasting objects. And uh, again, all of them refer to different decades. Some of them are not even uh, what we would conventionally call medieval and definitely Gizi shield and uh, a shield with a gun barrel uh, cannot be uh, uh, attributed to 1400s, which is the setting of his novel. Then Soseki describes this shield in uh, details. And even though there are similar shields on display in uh, the royal armories, uh, it seems that he uh, used his imagination uh, quite a lot. So as an overall conclusion, I think Natsume Soseki's writings, they demonstrate that the conclusions for the first and the second part, they still hold true. and. Uh, his work reflects uh, that quite nicely. So the Victorians constructed an image of Middle Ages as this kind of ideal and heroic past. And Middle Ages were seen as a homogeneous and a monolithic period that was inherently moral and aesthetically pleasing. And the medieval knight 
as a construction of maleness was identified by the armored body with no specific adherence to a period. Therefore, a generic image of the armor with no specific attention to historical accuracy served the purpose just as well. And uh, to finish my presentation, uh, I would like maybe to mention that in popular uh, culture of the 21st century, you sometimes can see uh, more or less uh, the same idea around the suit of armor and how it constructs masculinity with no specific attention to historical accuracy. And that's all I have. Thank you. No, thank you, Anna. Uh, observant viewers may notice um, I've had to relocate. Unfortunately, a car alarm has gone off just outside and I didn't want it drowning out the, the uh, discussion. So apologies for that. But thank you, Anna, for an absolutely fascinating talk. For the for the uninitiated, there was that Maori that you were speaking at the start. Uh, can you please repeat it? Sorry, for the uninitiated, was that Maori that you were speaking at the start? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> I, uh, no, this this was a. A, a tricky one to illustrate the publicity because of its wide range. Is medievalism a primarily British phenomenon? Is it an English speaking one that spreads to America or do France, Spain, Russia all engage with the medieval past in a, in a similar way? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I focused on Britain mm -hmm. uh, because I think it was it crystallized in Britain the mm -hmm. most because mm -hmm. Britain was not um, uh, kind of embroiled in this kind of uh, national wars and in conflicts that um, mm -hmm. European countries had to uh, persevere. And therefore, this mm -hmm. imagery of the conquest and of warfare, for them, it was slightly different. So when we're talking about British uh, empire in the 19th century, mm -hmm. the history of the Britain is a history of colonialism. So they fought a lot of wars and many of them, most of them, all of them were not on the British territory. Mm -hmm. It was much easier to idealize the war as this kind of noble deed. When uh, for mm -hmm. Europeans, they uh, have seen probably more consequences of the warfare. Uh, having said that, medievalism in Europe was mm -hmm. very prominent and it would link to slightly different set of ideas. They would mm -hmm. be talking about their national identity, about their national language. For the first time, Europe would speak not in lingua franca, that mm -hmm. was French. Mm -hmm. They would speak in German and Dutch and they would enjoy reading literature in their own language as well, if we're talking about my home country, Russia, it is uh, mm -hmm. the rise of national thought and the birth of Russian language, Russian literature as well. Mm -hmm. So there is this component. And thinking specifically about Japan, how does Natsumi Soseki's sort of European-inspired medieval sell, uh, sell in Japan, or is it more about the cultural impact that it has? That's a tricky question. Can we separate one from another? Natsume <laughs> uh, Soseki, uh, his role cannot, it is very hard to overestimate his significance. Mm -hmm. He is truly the greatest writer mm -hmm. in Japan. And he's probably one of the first writers to write in this Western kind of uh, style uh, to write Western novels. Mm -hmm. But before going to London, Natsume Soseki was known as haiku poet mm -hmm. and as Chinese style poetry writer. So we see this person and we see this, those kind of conflicting ideas. He was not Christian. For example, when we're talking about mm -hmm. um, the author of um, Bushido, The Soul of Japan, Nitobe Nazo, he was Christian. And when he was kind of projecting these ideas about uh, Christianity and West, contrasting Western and Japanese thought, he was coming from a very different place. Natsume Soseki was Buddhist. Uh, 
even though he was the best and um, best known uh, professor of English literature in Japan, he didn't enjoy Europe. He hated his experience in London. It was very hard for him to live there. And if you read the, his essay, uh, Letter from London, mm. it is very bitter. So he was very impressed by European culture, probably not in, the ver- in a very positive way. Uh, mm. So when we're talking about his legacy, it was deeply impacted by the West and it would deeply impact the rest of Japanese literature. It is an uh, amalgamation Mm -hmm. of his Western education, Western style education and his Japanese um, experience and upbringing. And some of the uh, the mentions of the scene are are fascinating. The line of kings, unfortunately, are not 100%. It would have been Henry VI's armor that he saw the curators over the years struggle with uh, trying to to, to find the the right objects and things like that. Uh, The the tower is actually a a fairly well-established stop on the Victorian tourist route of London. Are there other Japanese views of the tower at this time that we have, that we can compare Natsumi Soseki's with, or is it it primarily his that we've, we've got? I think his is uh, the uh, most well known. There are other Japanese travelers uh, who would reside in London around the same time. And there were the travelers who uh, would visit London before that. And even we have an entire embassy that would visit uh, Europe in uh, 1860s. And they would leave massive and massive uh, amount of documents about their visits and about those places of, of heritage. Mm-hmm. I think Natsume Soseki is interesting because his account was actually translated back into English. Mm-hmm. So uh, what is thrilling is, of course, the interest of Natsume Soseki towards the tower, but also the interest of the English people to the interest of the Japanese person directed to the tower. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't dig quite deep into this presence (laughs) of your fine institution in Japanese uh, literature. I think that's an interesting project (laughs) to take. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the other thing that interests me is, uh, is this traffic all one way? Or are there people who are interested in medieval Japan, Japanese history within the UK or within Europe at, at this specific time? That's a fantastic question. Around uh, late Victorian time, there was a cultural phenomenon called Japanism. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my other works, I argue that Victorian exoticism had Mm -hmm. many facets. One of them was medievalism and the other was Japanese. And they kind of went hand in hand Mm -hmm. because in uh, 1860s, when Japan was finally open for trade, British uh, sent their an enormous number of people. So when we compare, for example, British presence in Japan and American, uh, there will be uh, 1,200 British residing in Japan compared to uh, 500 Americans. Mm -hmm. And there was a massive amount of literature published on Japan in Victorian England, starting from the Tales of Old Japan by Algernon Bertram Midford, uh, in 1871, and then works by um, uh, Lafcadio Hearn, uh, mm-hmm. Basil Hall Chamberlain, they would create this image of Japan as a country that is still in medieval past. So people mm-hmm. who were interested in medieval past, they would be interested in Japan by extension. Mm-hmm. Um, you would find many mentions of uh, and many uh, interpretations of Japanese history in the terms of English history. So for example, Genpei War, War of Tyre and Minamoto will mm-hmm. be called Japanese War of Roses. Even though, you know, War of Tyre and Minamoto preceded War of Roses mm-hmm. by 200 years. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah. Also, there was an artistic movement when we're talking about pre raphaelite Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. They were very heavily influenced by Japanese art. And Japanese in painting would seep into this kind of aesthetic canon. They would be seen in Japan as this metaphorical land of liberation from mm -hmm. patriarchal norms because Japan mm -hmm. was more liberal in terms of... Uh, many things like mm. sexual life mm. and the style of, of dressing and style mm. of art. Yeah, no, it'd be interesting to dig through our catalogue because a lot of the material from British colonial possessions comes in as curiosities and it's just labelled as spear. It would be interesting to see actually, you know, how much more seriously they take Japanese weaponry, how much more detail they provide behind it. But that would require a lot of digging through the old catalogues, which might take me a while. Now... Um, Coming back to the, the, the European stuff, so you mentioned that accuracy often plays little part in the depictions. Can you, can you bring to mind the, the worst depiction of European armour that you've ever seen in a, a painting? Um, unfortunately, I do not have it in hand, but there was a depiction, I think it was... Just have to name names. Uh, it was an illustration for the poem... Uh, Mm -hmm. might have been Lamia, the poem. And there is an image of, of a knight who is being seduced by this mermaid kind of figure. And this uh, knight, is he's roughly covered, you know, in, in black, this kind of sleek, mm -hmm. <laughs> reminding more than uh, cars and automobiles kind of uh, uh, body protective equipment i don't think there was an idea to uh, copy an existing object mm -hmm. uh, so there is that mm -hmm. then um, dante gabriel rosetti is pretty frivolous around his helmets those at times you see it flashed faced uh, pivoted visors mm -hmm. um, top helms and you're like where where does it come from <laughs> it is interesting like where it was copied from and i actually tried to research what was his source of inspiration what kind mm -hmm. of materials were available for him in 1860s mm -hmm. because it precedes uh, john hewitt's publication of uh, the book of, on arms and armor mm -hmm. so i do not have an answer what is happening there and also, my one of my favorite examples is a famous painting of John Dark, who is wearing full Maximilian suit of armor. Mm -hmm. um, the depiction of the armor is very accurate, but John mm -hmm. Dark didn't live in 1500s, so she probably had no exposure to this kind of artifacts. Mm -hmm. I know it, it's interesting that there's so much gothic armor in there because you know you, you mentioned the distinguishing between the male and the female forms, but actually I find gothic armor quite delicate and flute and and actually quite, quite fashionable. Is it you know it, is gothic armor probably the predominant style that you see? I find it quite interesting mm -hmm. uh, as well, and that was. Uh, I had to go through uh, self-doubt and self-reflection because I personally think that Gothic armor is the, the best armor in the world. You know, it's the most beautiful. Why is it Gothic? Because it looks just as a Gothic mm -hmm. cathedral with its uh, beautiful fluting resembling uh, is Gothic architectural elements. Mm -hmm. So the term itself is coming from that era. And Gothic revival and Gothic armor probably kind of go hand in hand. Uh, I find that it is probably used because, as you said, it is very tightly fitting. So uh, this armor in all of the depictions, it looks as if it fits uh, the wearer as the second skin. It doesn't add any bulk uh, compared to Maximilian suit of armor with the breastplate that is uh, kind of bulging. And uh, uh, it doesn't make this figure look bigger or less human. Mm -hmm. So it is just, you know, a man of steel. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. his skin. It's the projection of the wearer's body rather than a piece of equipment that 
is a thing in itself and has its own shape distinct from human body. Yeah. I think there is much to contemplate in that direction. Yeah. And I guess one last question sort of drawing from that, which is, does Victorian medievalism and interest in armour ever spill over into broader fashion? Are there attempts to make men's suits slightly more gothic, slightly more fluted, perhaps? It's an interesting question mm -hmm. and an interesting observation. I haven't noticed it and I have done no research on that. Yeah. I, I struggle to bring any to mind as well instantly, but maybe there are some there lurking somewhere. Um, it is interesting because the suit of armor bears a lot of features of contemporary dress. So when we're talking about you know, Gothic armor, you will see this kind of pleating happening at the back, which harkens mm -hmm. back to you know German cheque. Mm -hmm. um, or you will see you know uh, puffs and uh, slashes, which is the costume armor in its prime. Uh, but when we're talking about the dress of the Victorian uh, noble people, I can see no resemblance, mm. actually. Mm -hmm. I do not think uh, uh, it was, at least it probably was not noticeable. Unlike female costume, mm -hmm. where this kind of Renaissance idea mm -hmm. of uh, floating silks would translate into artistic dress or aesthetic dress. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, but a, a sort of interesting uh, place to leave off. Uh, so, just before we uh, before we sort of uh, leave, do you have any social media accounts? If anyone has any further questions that they might like to direct your way, that you could recommend. Oh, uh, you can go back to my first slide, and there is my email address. Mm -hmm. So, if you have any further questions, I'm uh, happy to, to answer them. Fantastic, but yeah, but thank you very much to, to Anna for today's lecture. And uh, yes, if you have any questions that are Arms and Armour related or Tower of London related or anything like that, then inquiries at armories.org.uk will get you in touch with our curators. I guess, Anna, if you want to follow up on what that Henry VI armour might actually have been, uh, that's probably the, uh, the, the way to go about it. But yes, thank you again for today's lecture. Absolutely fascinating look into the the cross-cultural impact of, of arm, which is exactly what we're interested in. And thank you to Adam for producing the event behind the scenes, as always. And thank you to the audience for joining us a little bit earlier than normal. Uh, sadly, this is the last of our lectures for the year, but the talks will restart in the new year. And our first on the 26th of January looks at how the First World War was brought home to the northeastern England through all the and how people responded to this new way of using weapons. After that, on the 9th of February, we'll look at a spectacularly gold-trimmed sword hilt hidden since the Viking period and what it tells us about the role of the sword in medieval society. For details of this and all our future events, keep an eye on our website, which is royalarmories.org. Uh, follow on the social media network of your choice and consider following us on Eventbrite. In the meantime, thank you again for spending time with us. Uh, have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, subject to new variants, obviously, and I look forward to to see you all in 2022. Thank you.